So in terms of um, in terms of the session, this is different from the other sessions that we've run in that most of our sessions really are panel sessions whereby different people uh, have been asked different questions and whatnot. This, this is a very hands-on session and really what you'll find is there's probably a lot of me in this in this presentation now some of the difference there is a lot of brokers that have seen this presentation but there's probably some some elements to this that a lot of funders have wanted uh and that probably would would indicate why there's been so many different people register for the session um you'll forgive me that uh i will be pausing through through the session simply to uh let people in but I'll kick off. So look, I've obviously got to thank our supporters for the day being um, Cashflow Finance, Scott Back, and of course, MoneyTech. And the reason why we've got our sponsors with us for this particular session is so we've got lenders that, that actually do provide us um, uh, an indication of, of the sort of transactions whereby debtor finance and asset finance can work well together. Now, there's a few brokers on the call, and I think that um, there's a, a lot of people that will get a lot of benefit out of today. So if you look at an asset finance transaction and you look at a marginal transaction, generally the sort of feedback you're going to see from a lender, it'll either be a no, yes, but we want the client to pay it back sooner uh, or have it fully amortised. Yes, we want the client to contribute a larger deposit, we might want a secured guarantee. Um, and for some lenders, not every lender has the ability to do it, but um, they might want to price the risk accordingly. A lot of people don't seem to realise that a client's debtor book is an asset that, a, that lenders can get some comfort from. If you control the cash flow, you control your client. I think it's interesting that a lot of people haven't thought about why are clients more likely to get a sharper price or an easier approval with their trading bank? And the reality is it's because they have property or other security behind a transaction. A lot of the asset finance brokers um, who are slowly dropping in now, um, they, they have seen this themselves. It would be very rare for a broker not to have had a deal whereby they've got everything done. It's all ready. It's all package approved. And then, uh, their main trading bank has come in at the last minute and decided to come in over the top. And a lot of the time, that is because they have subsequent collateral security. What, what I find really interesting is the fact that most brokers and lenders seem to think that everything is set in a particular period of time. I think it's important when you're a broker or even if, if you're a BDM putting together a proposal, security and appetite is always going to be relevant and it's never still. There is always a change, whether it be cost of funds, whether it be availability of funds, whether it be the, the size of a book, whether it be the area of a book. It's very interesting to me that a lot of people seem to think, right, I'm gonna do things this way, this is the only way I'm gonna do it and this is the way I'm gonna submit a deal. If you're not thinking outside the box, or certainly, certainly in a COVID environment, there are so many transactions that were automatic yeses, which are now automatic noes. Some of those are automatic yeses that are now, uh, but we need to know a whole lot more. Um, so really, the, the onus has really come for, for anyone trying to put a deal into a credit department. How are we going to do that? How are we going to represent a client's best interest? And, it means knowing first up what's appropriate, what's a lender going to buy. So for, the, for many people, trade and debt of finance it is a foreign thing. Let me make it as easy as I can. A business has two ways they can look at their cash flow. They can either look at their receivables, i.e. who owes them money and make them pay earlier, or they can look at their bills and people they need to pay and push those out. And debtor and trade finance really allows someone to utilise finance to, to, to achieve that. So debtor finance allows someone to bring their, their, their cash flow forward. Trade finance allows someone to 
to pay their suppliers at a at a slower rate or, or pay a financier in lieu. Look, for the clients that grow quickly, it's most useful because it, it really means that a client can grow without being tied to their property security. Um, it's really useful when the sales cycle's under a near 90 days and it works brilliantly where suppliers offer discounted trade terms for upfront payment. Works beautifully. Um, and some businesses have sales cycles that push to, to 180 days and need both. Um, there's so many reasons why this space isn't focused on um, by brokers today. And I think a large chunk of that, as my screen decides to, 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 to pause on me, apologies. There's many brokers that won't know actually what debtors are. Minimal settled deals. So if, yeah, if you're not doing a lot of it, you're not, not seeing a lot of income in that area. There's a lot of expectations in line with some of the other lenders. So if you're a debtor financier and you're on a panel on, with a, a mortgage aggregation business, there's a lot that these other businesses are geared to provide. So the, the, a lot of the, the, the lenders and aggregators, there's just not a, the same level of service proposition in debtor finance and trade finance that these aggregators are used to seeing as a rule. These guys are used to, to, to having very detailed and, and elaborate uh, service from the aggregation to the aggregator, which is different. And look, I'll explain why that's uh, the flip side to that and why it's so great for brokers themselves on the other side. Um, generally, debt of finance gets a bad rap because people are caught up with the concept of factoring. Um, Data finance has evolved dramatically and really from what I've seen, I've really only been focused on data finance over the last two, two and a half years. And I've found so much, uh, there's been so much movement just in the last two years in terms of the different product ranges that are out there, the different aspects of the different ways people look at things. Yeah, the fundamentals might be the same, but there's all sorts of bells and whistles now that a lot of lenders are looking at um, to get more brokers into this space. And today, what we're really talking about is how data finance is, is helping people write more equipment finance. Um, it's funny because data finance really is an asset and should be treated like asset finance, um, but most people aren't looking at it. I think the big what's changed, I mean, <laughs> I could just put a slide there and say COVID, but uh, I'm a little bit sick of people using COVID as an excuse for a lot of things. Um, someone used the phrase, the new normal this morning, can't stand it. You'll never hear that from me. Um, I think data finance, you'll find the reason why people are, are learning more about it is because you've got all these resi mortgage brokers that, hey, things got a little bit difficult. People were worried about their income streams and they've had to look at, at alternatives. Business banking is only going to get harder. There's a lot of people that know who a prosper or a get capital is, but might not know who a, a Scottish Pacific, a money tech or a cash flow finance is. Hopefully that'll change by the end of today. Um, but really the people are looking for a quick fix. And uh, one of our supporters in yesterday's session used a great example around the concept of a sugar fix broker. There is way too many people in our space that Certainly in, in the asset space, we're looking for a hit. We're looking for a sugar hit. We're looking, hey, someone needs their truck. People need their car. Let's get it done. Well, things for bigger clients may not be so easy. And debt of finance can really sweeten the pot, so to speak, um, for lenders on a, on a deal that might be marginal. The revenue is fantastic. And there's some industries that have really inbuilt barriers that debt of finance can really solve. Transport being the most obvious one and is out there, but there's plenty of others. Uh, alcohol, recruitment, and I'm sure our panel will comment on that in more detail. In terms of the cost of debt of finance, look, the interest rate on it, we, we did have a session on Monday about the different costs of debt of finance. Um, I don't know whether we got to where I think we'd all like to be in terms of that session, in terms of summarising where the, those costs and, and things are. And, I'll be doing my best to provide some more information for our attendees post the event. But um, the, the beautiful part 
if we go back here um, to why someone should be looking at, at asset finance and debtor finance together, um, you would be absolutely amazed. And I'm going to call out the BDMs that are on this call. You've got Patricia, you've got Amanda, you've got Luke, have to be three of the best BDMs in debtor finance going around. Um, they, to, they take so much of the heavy lifting off our shoulders as brokers. It really allows us to get moving and do our, and the, the leverage that we have as a broker, being able to lean on a BDM to run with the ball uh, is, is massive and really is, is quite helpful, certainly for me in my first few years. The big thing that people look at, and a lot of brokers, we're very guilty of doing this. And I think a lot of us are generally when we're selling. So calling that out for what it is. We seem to be very quick to look at the costs. But what we're terrible at is understanding the opportunity cost. If a client doesn't have that particular piece of equipment, they might not be able to capitalise on a whole season worth of trading, a whole new area of their business a larger client. So if there's an opportunity to meet that equipment finance need by taking on debtor finance or at least bothering to understand how debtor finance can work in and, and work with the lender, then you're really not doing the best thing for your client. Uh, the opportunity cost of not having the equipment is a lot more than simply not being able to make a repayment in many cases. It's not our business. We don't know those different lines. We don't know what those opportunity costs are. The clients do. So it's really important when we look at rate, when we look at cost, when we look at payments, we need to think of them in relation to our clients and no more. There is no indicative interest rate that is good and bad. There is lenders out there that have 20, 30, 40% interest rates. Now, I should tell you, all of the lenders on our panel that we are talking about today do not have rates that are that high. But the bottom line is, it does not matter what the rate is, if a client needs a piece of equipment and that's the rate that that client you know, needs to pay based on the risk profile or the, the, the track record or what have you, these clients, they know their business better than, our, than we do and we need to be really careful uh, when we start thinking that way. Um, for debt of finance, in terms of the clients we're looking at, you're looking at B2B, not B2C. You can look at trade finance for, for B2C. Um, any business that gets a discount for early payments of suppliers, there's a particular person that I'm working with on the panel at the moment. We have a client that has a 10% discount that they get from their supplier and a 15% discount they offer for early payment. You could find the most expensive lender in debt of finance and double it, and you would still be giving away more uh, by not taking debt of finance. So again, it's about opportunity cost. Um, when I wrote this presentation, this was right at the start of COVID. Um, and the one thing that everyone, everything was safe for was, was, was supermarkets. If someone's selling into a supermarket, it made sense. I, I suppose the flip side to that is that um, a lot of the supermarkets do tend to push out payment terms. So that, that's a good example, but look, any client who's selling into a, a larger business is probably a very good place to start. Um, there's obviously other areas that, that um, our panel will expand on in more details. Um, if we look at this the other way, an asset finance client looking at for debtor finance, really the best way to look at it would be a client that's growing too quickly for their funding lines, good place to start. Um, any whose financials don't service, but have larger companies who owe money. So that's, that's a really good place to look. And probably any business reliant on a new contract for work. There's one or two people that were looking at this, this call and early days they had this conversation and said, Chris, why am I going to attend this webinar? You know, I write luxury cars. How is debtor finance going to help me write a luxury car for a client? And my answer was pretty simple. If you go all the way back to our fundamentals, the, the clients with the more risky and the more line ball transactions to sweeten the pot, you need to be looking at putting more in. Um, and how's your client going to come up with that large deposit on that new Lamborghini or Ferrari? They're going to have to bring some cash flow forward. So there's all sorts of different reasons you can look at this. It shouldn't be limited to one. 
And if you start looking at all of your transactions and consider this each time, you'll be amazed at the type of transactions whereby debtor and asset clients can work together. Um, and part of that, I suppose for me, is when you actually get moving on this, you'll find that the add-on to what you're selling might not, might not be the debtor finance. It may well be that you look at debtor finance first and asset finance second. Um, I must say, when I first started looking at debtor finance, it was something I looked at as, as an add-on uh, for existing clients. But what I found very quickly was that debtor finance and working capital is really where the juice is. Once we're having more detailed conversations with clients, you know, things like their fleet of equipment become second nature. Someone's not going anywhere if you're the broker that organises their working capital. So I've probably done enough speaking. I'd like to hear from the experts. Um, in terms of the lenders that are on our panel today, being Money Tech, uh, Scott Pack, Cashflow, um, these are all lenders who I know personally have been quite successful at looking at both, both areas. And really, I, I think it's most beneficial, rather than hearing me talk about how I've uh, been successful in this space, I wouldn't mind hearing from our panel today. So I'll kick off with you, Luke. Luke, you've heard enough of me talking, mate. I want to hear uh, some examples and just understand how you guys specifically look at debtor finance and asset finance transactions together and some successes and scenarios. Probably trying to be specific as we can about recency, just being, you know, coming out of COVID, I think it's important that all the examples we look at today are, are as recent as possible. Yeah, sure. Thanks, mate. Uh, hoping you can all hear me. Um, yeah, look, um, for us, uh, it, you're really in a fortunate position as an invoice financier, which is Chris has alluded to a couple of times, where you get an enormous level of oversight over a business and you've got consistent touch points with that client, client sometimes as regularly as weekly, even daily. Um, so it's very easy for you to therefore stretch certain aspects of a transaction that a specific or specialist asset financier might otherwise find difficult to do. That could be repayment term extending from three years to five years. It could be a, a larger LVR on the asset, could be a quirkier asset. Uh, we recently did a deal for a client who wanted to fund some hyperbaric chambers. So we can look at these things and because we have that extra level of oversight with the client, but also uh, we're generally secured very strongly via a GSA versus a specific registration of the asset alone. So we can be a little bit more um, flexible on a lot of those terms and we tend to take a bigger picture view when we're also providing debtor financing to the client as well. So a recent transaction we helped with was um, an acquisition deal actually, um, and it was for a manufacturing business, a food manufacturing business. Fundamentally, he had a big timing problem. He had no working capital in place. Um, there was an existing manufacturing business and he had, like I said, no working capital in place. So he generated a little bit of creditor pressure, small ATO arrears, and then he, this awesome opportunity had come up out of COVID to buy another business, which was a bottling plant, um, which would have opened him up to all sorts of opportunities. Um, we were able, he was knocked back time and time again by some asset financiers who were concerned about uh, the business's current trading position, the ATO arrears, the quirkiness or the kind of specialised nature of the asset in question, um, we were kind of able to step in, provide him with a debtor financing facility, which addressed his fundamental working capital problems to prevent further issues with creditors in the ATO in the future, um, but also allowed him to kind of get access to and fund the purchase of that bottling line. So what that meant for him was he came out of that um, with a new business, um, two new pieces of equipment, which allowed him to really access a whole new suite of customers and a working capital solution, which meant he could grow using both of those assets without running into headaches and, you know, delaying payments with creditors, which you alluded to earlier, Chris. So that's one quick win we had with that particular client. Um, and probably the most recent example I've got for you at this stage, but like I said, if we can take a more holistic view on a business, it allows us to stretch some of those other things and do quirkier assets, longer terms, um, and those sorts of things. It's funny you should mention that, Luke, because obviously the, the sessions this morning um, were sort of leading into this. And I, I think that 
it doesn't really matter which transaction someone looks at. If it's B2B, there's certainly a lot more, and you covered it really well. Obviously, there's different aspects of a transaction around term, asset, risk. A lot of those can be mitigated by having both, especially when your, your debtor finance can be the takeout. Now, for those that were on our sessions earlier, obviously, it, it's one thing to service a deal, but not every deal has to service as long as a lender's takeout position is clear, clear and to an extent clean. So with debt of finance, it obviously smooths that process and makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, from, from yourself, Patricia, um, interested to know, I suppose, how you guys look at, at the two of them together. Uh, obviously, I, I should say that for all those people listening out there, I can, I can say with, with hand on heart that all of our lenders on panel are very good at this working together and you'd be quite crazy if you haven't been looking at scenarios that are, you know, bottom shelf or not necessarily where you're, you're thinking they're going to be. You'd be crazy not looking at any of our panel for those clients that are B2B uh, and just exactly workshopping and working through how this works. So, Patricia, you've got the floor. Tell me yep. how, uh, how have you been finding things? What are some of the recent successes you guys have had? across asset finance and debt of finance um, since COVID as well. Yep. Um, so as you know, uh, with uh, if we're looking at just standalone asset finance, we probably, uh, you know, max out at a million in asset finance limits. But then uh, this is where we come in. If someone's um, looking to fund more of its assets, um, so with the debt of finance, one of the biggest advantage with using an invoice finance is you know, you have the certainty of the cash flow. Um, you know, you you you're constantly with a standalone asset finance. You you're asking yourself, can the guy service it? But as soon as you're debtor financing, you can see the cash flow. You can see the contracts the clients taking up, and you can see the growth of that business. So that's why you can take a lot more risk in terms of funding. You know, not only primary assets, but, you know, the stuff that we are funding when there is a data finance solution, we're funding uh, secondary and even tertiary uh, tertiary assets. Um, so, but some of the more recent, I guess, examples of transactions that uh, we've looked at are essentially capital raising against unencumbered assets. And this is a real, a great way to actually raise, raise capital to either buy out a competitor or to buy a business, expand your business. So, but you can do that only if you're teaming that up with, with an invoice finance solution. So um, recently, well, there are various sizes of transactions. I've done a fairly, mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, a, a big one, um, about 150 mil, and that was 100 mil in invoice finance and 50 mil in asset finance, and that was an actual acquisition. And we weren't only able to tip in the acquisition funding, but there was leftover working capital to fund the business. Um, and I guess on the smaller end, uh, where this is commercial broker referred transactions, uh, Elise and I have just done one. Um, do you want to talk about it, Elise? Just, just it was a really good combination yeah. deal where we pulled um, a lot of equity out of uh, both the clients and the company that they were looking to purchase their assets as well. Um, and unfortunately, the asset finance tapped out, but the deal still went ahead because the debtor finance kicked in and we could utilize the company that they were looking to purchase their invoices as well. So yeah, overall solution sell between the two of them, it was perfect. Great stuff. And Amanda, can you can you share how, how you guys look at the two of them together and, and some, some successes post COVID or in, in the current climate? Yeah, so probably, um, Pre-COVID, we probably would have done a lot of um, capital raisings as well using assets, but probably what we're seeing more, and, and John can jump on and, and add to this as well, is um, businesses who put their payments on deferral with other lenders and maybe aren't necessarily qualifying for debtor um, just based on that alone. Uh, sorry, aren't qualifying for asset based on that alone. So when we can do the combined debtor solution, we obviously have a lot more comfort over the lend and we'll be more flexible on what we can do. So whether it's the asset type or whether it's the financial performance or um, the fact that they've, they've put their payments on deferral, we have a lot more comfort around what we'd be willing to lend and how much we'd be willing to lend. 
And one of the other things is besides visibility, it's also the ability to hold back the payments from the ledger to make sure that they can keep on top of their, their payments, whether it's you know monthly or fortnightly or whatever the cycle is. So we can actually hold back available funds from the debtor facility to make sure that the equipment lend is looked after. Um, and that just gives our team a lot more comfort on servicing. So we've done one just in the last week, actually, where they had their payments on deferral. Um, most other lenders weren't willing to look at it. So we were able to come in and provide three different types of assets. They're all yellow goods. Um, so typically assets that a lot of funders would, would have liked pre-COVID. Um, we, we've jumped in and provided that and put in place a $300,000 debtor facility to help um, make sure that they can maintain that servicing. Right. Do you want to add to that, John, at all? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Amanda. Um, I think if we go back to the beginning and we look at, excuse me for a moment, <clears throat> traditionally asset financiers are, are looking at a different client profile. Um, asset finance is looking for a stronger client with a more robust cash flow. Um, and that's primarily because once we, we settle the deal, we then sit back and hope that the client makes their payments on time. Uh, we've got no further influence to, to exert on the client. Um, whereas a debtor finance deals more about clients who have got a stressed um, cash flow, maybe they've taken on a new contract and they need new assets to, to achieve that. Um, but the reason why we get so much more comfort about, about it all is because from a debtor finance position, we've got more levers that we can do to manage the client as we go forward. So we can increase or decrease the concentration levels to any particular debtor. Um, we can increase or decrease the advance rate. And if we decrease the advance rate, then we've got greater retentions there, which we can then use to offset against the asset finance transaction if it starts to get a bit shaky. So um, we also have an integrated um, facility deed, which links the two facilities together, which means that in the event of, um, we, we might have a large asset exposure with the debtor finance, and the client then might decide at some stage later in the track to refinance their debtor elsewhere. Our integrated deed says, well, that's fine, but you need to clear our equipment finance. So we've got some control over what happens with the client going forward. Uh, likewise, if they end up in administration, we can then lean upon the retentions to help clear out um, any shortfall that may, may occur. So the, the increased security position when we use it properly, we get a lot more comfort about the client going forward. And I think as Luke mentioned earlier, you can start doing some more um, unusual assets um, or you can start going out a little bit further on the limb because you know you've got control. Thanks, John. And, and look, I'm, I'm gonna give Luke another say here because I feel like uh, he's been double teamed by everyone here. There's uh, two, two heads on, on uh, our other panel. So, Look, I'm going to give you a, a, a last a last reply. There is there is there aspects there uh, from that have been brought up by our uh, other panelists that you, you feel are also fairly relevant in, in your space as well. Oh yeah, definitely. So I think um I, I think it was um someone I mentioned earlier. I can't have forgotten who, but someone said solution cell, uh, and that's really what it's all about. Um, Fundamentally, clients are managing one relationship with one business, uh, generally one credit manager who's underwriting the transaction for both their asset financing and their working capital solution. And that's something that um, any business that's managing a fleet of trucks and trailers and has, you know, warehouse arrangements over here and invoice finance arrangement over here, they'll, they'll talk about the workload involved in managing their credit managers for their various financiers. So having one place to go is another major major win for a lot of clients um, and one place to go and get that solution um, and we've, I think a few of us have spoken about other opportunities where businesses have been able to get a hold of an asset or get a hold of an opportunity that they otherwise weren't able to get a hold of simply by virtue of the fact that their invoice finance here is more heavily involved um, we're not taking a back seat once the transaction is settled so yeah look I think everyone's covered everything off very nicely and I think um, it's a it's definitely something we hope um, brokers will focus more on going forward and be willing to look at going forward. Thanks, Luke. I, 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 I want to make sure that everyone, I, I keep reiterating this. Um, for those attending, please don't be a stranger. Please use the chat function on this. Um, we're all spending time out of our businesses and, and uh, helping each other learn. The best thing you can do is make sure that if there's anything that you'd like to be covered off in, in more detail, please use the chat function. 
you can use it privately, that's fine. Happy to bring them up uh, myself on your behalf or alternatively use the chat function, we'll cover them together. Um, you mentioned before and everyone sort of had covered aspects, Luke, as well of, of the solution selling. And I'll be honest, that's really where I see the juice for debtor finance for me. I really like seeing debtor and asset together. It's, that's the area I enjoy playing probably the most, if, if I'm honest. Um, the one thing I, I, I would say to that is that we really are in a perfect storm in that we have a series of clients who aren't going to be as favourable with their existing bank. That's going to change. We're going to have clients that are now either no longer bank clients or no longer clients uh, making repayments. So they become clients whereby additional security is needed. And I think that the the example, and John lent on it, but uh, and I know that the other lenders on our panel also do this. Um, when clients are deferring repayments, their credit file, we need lenders who are actually going to take a holistic view. And thankfully, our panel of lenders today do that um, by looking at both aspects. There's many lenders in debtor finance that are great at looking at alternative security, um, but specifically, the three on our panel are quite great on it. But the one thing that I wanted to, to move to, um, one of the someone had provided me some feedback, which is great around, hey, we're loving broker Illuminati, but we'd like things to be more specific. Uh, we'd like something a little bit more to run with. And I think in fairness, our, our panelists for previous sessions and whatnot, um, everyone has been quite, um, not, they, they haven't been vague, but they, they don't want to, they don't want to overstep. And I think that with today's session, Hopefully, people that are attending this, they'll know exactly where I think their next step should be. And I'll certainly throw back to our panel to get a sense of what their key takeouts are. So if I'm leaving today's session and I've never done anything in debt or in trade before, my top questions are these. It's really simple, not that hard. Do you receive discounts from your suppliers if you pay them early? The other one, how does your business currently fund working capital and do your customers pay on time? The other one, which is an interesting one, if your cash flow was brought forward a few months, what, would you, what could you do with the money? Um, for the asset finance brokers attending this, it's a little bit similar to the question I like, works really well if you work with an accounting firm. What's your capital expenditure plans for the next 12 months? So when you throw all of those together, um, there's a lot you can achieve by getting clients to talk more about that side of things. And um, to quote someone who's just recently jumped on our call, it makes us more than a sugar fix broker. Some changes to your existing process. Request the latest accounts payable and accounts receivable ledgers with all of your doc requests. It's a big one, pretty easy to do. And it gives you a little bit more detail in terms of what's going on with the business. It's not that obtrusive. And if you need the financials anyway, who cares? Uh, clients are pretty happy to provide it. What you're finding now is that lenders are much keener on the current rather than your balance sheet and your profit loss. And this is the thing. We, we sort of talked about the, the, why, lenders are, why the lenders on our panel are very keen to, to take on more risk. But the reason why is because they have adequate transparency. Most lenders previously, they'd get a set of financials and go, oh, awesome. Here's a, here's a set of profit and loss and balance sheet, great. Well, that's a snapshot at that particular day. Since COVID, people want bank statements, fast statements. More people care about tax debt. The reason why our panel and most debtor lenders are willing to take more risk is because they get a very intimate look at a business. So the other part of that is the bank statements. A lot of the time you have to provide bank statements now anyway. So if you have to provide the bank statements, have a look through them. See who's paying and the frequency. Um, check out if you see any unsecured loans in there and ask why the client's got them. Um, get in there and, and do some and have a bit of a dig. Um, really big opportunity. Um, some steps to actually get started. How are you going to start looking if you're an asset finance broker, how are you going to get started with this? Look at all the sets of financials you've got. 
look at the ones that have a larger uh, percentage of trade debtors as a percentage of their gross revenue. Great tip. Um, it's probably one of my starting points these days. Um, I've said this before. This isn't just a plug because they're supporting our session. It doesn't matter. The lender BDMs in debtor finance do a ton, ton of lifting. You don't understand. They will really get involved. Every single BDM on this panel have lifted oh, exceptionally heavy weights when it comes to working hard with my clients. You have no idea. Patricia, Luke, Amanda, they have done an amazing job. And albeit on a small forum, they know that uh, my thanks will continue for some time by probably finding more deals for them to keep lifting. Um, <laughs> you need to tell people you do this. This is the weirdest part. No one says that they do this. No one says, I, hey, I do data finance. Awesome, please keep not telling people you do them. I'm, ha I'm happy to look after all of those clients. There's tons of clients that need this. If you bother to tell people you can help, surprise, surprise, you might get opportunities. Um, particularly engage with referral partners. So before I leave and wrap this up, um, I want to talk about the golden rule of data finance. Um, there's only one client that comes to you and asks for data finance. And they're the client that already has data finance. One of the things that I think a lot of people struggle with, especially a mortgage broker or, a, or an asset finance broker, is people simply don't love that. They hate the word. They think that debt of finance is like factoring. It's like an F word. And quite frankly, for many people, they treat this as an F word. It's really just a different form of working capital that grows when their business grows and doesn't involve property security. And if you start from that premise, you'll find a lot more open conversations uh, and you will find a lot more people being, being willing to consider the alternative. Um, for those people that see the, the picture of Brad Pitt, um, that's not just for the ladies. It's uh, all the guys. We can't discriminate in 2020. It's really all about the fact that that's from the movie Fight Club. And the first rule of Fight Club is that we don't talk about Fight Club. If you want to be good at data finance, don't talk about data finance. Talk about working capital. Talk about working capital. Talk about the pain points in the business and you'll be surprised where that goes. For those people that want a copy of today's presentation, happy to forward it to you. There's some great sessions. You really need to come to our keynote speaker, Craig Johnston, tomorrow. It's open for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a BDM, a broker, whoever. Um, I know that that is going to be fantastic. Craig Johnston is an icon in Australian football and really play, blazed the trail for many. The Mark Viduka, Harry Kuehl, Mark Bosnich. Most people would, would acknowledge that Many of them would never be at the level of at the Premier League without someone like Craig Johnston blazing the trail. And for those people that have no interest whatsoever in football, um, hey, he's a lot more than a football player too. This is a guy that uh, invented some crazy things. He was a, a photographer uh, traveling the world. He was a producer. A, he wrote a rap song. This guy is crazy. You need to hear from him. But before we finish up, um, I've talked about my secrets and, and, and whatnot, um, and I've given all of our BDMs quite the plug. Uh, it's because they're just awesome and they've helped my business. But before I let them go, I'd love to hear from them one tip that they would look at for someone who's attending this today. They've never looked at data finance. What's their first, if, they, if they get one takeaway, what's the takeaway? And I'll kick off with you, Luke. You get one takeaway. What's it going to be? Someone, the broker is attending today. What's the one thing you'd like them to get out of it? Um, so based on all the stuff you've gone through today. Yeah, is that what you're, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so I think your point earlier, just you're collecting information from a client already. You've already got that level of trust. It's not really asking the client that much to give them or ask them for a copy of a receivables or payables ledger so you can better understand what their fundamental working capital problem might look like. And you can really, the benefits can be enormous um, if 
by simply asking for that little bit of additional information. So do that, back yourself to identify the opportunity and pick up the phone to someone on this call and you might find yourself with a winner. Thanks, Luke. Do you want another quick, a quickie, quick single? Because I'm going to give Elise a go and I'm going to give right, John a go. All, all, all right, all right. <laughs> there you go, mate. There you go. Uh, Patricia, Elise, one takeaway. What is it? From a broker and I attended today. Sorry. All right. Um, look, I, I think that, you know, as brokers, uh, you guys aren't specialized in, in invoice finance or data finance. Um, you've got the specialists between all of us, including Chris. Um, so you don't have to be an expert at the product, but if you have any queries, all you've got to do is identify the, the fact that there's an unpaid invoice, uh, that's an asset. There's an, with regards to asset finance, look at the balance sheet, there's an asset being a vehicle or plant and equipment. And, and don't forget, there's also trade finance where if the guy is buying goods, goods, then you can actually seek funding against it. And as BDMs, we are all open to taking your inquiries and helping you structure it. That's our passion. We absolutely love doing that. Elise, I'm go on. Asset investment thing. I, I was an asset finance broker. I live and breathe asset finance. But since starting at Scopac, um, my knowledge of, you know, what what could have been in all of my previous deals is just um, <laughs> there's no end to it. You know, there's there's so many more so many more options. And honestly, rely on these guys to take you to where your clients need to be. Like whether you know about it or not, just get them to have a look at something for you, and you never know what's going to become of it. Yeah, spot on. Thanks, Elise. Thanks, Patricia. And uh, the last words to Amanda and John. Oh, look, I think, you know, it's it's a little bit of what everyone said. Obviously, you've got, um, you know, specialists here, so you need to lean on your lender a little bit more. Um, but also, I would, I would just say think outside the box a little bit where you might have, you know, traditionally thrown a deal to an unsecured lender or um, similar because you think it's the, the easier solution. Um, there are lenders out there that will work hard with you to think outside of the box and find a solution for your clients that works for them in the long term. John? Um, yeah, the, the, you know, like uh, the brokers to take away is if, if you get a declined or uh, unfavorable terms on an asset finance uh, application, just think, will, will debtor solve this problem? Will it add value to the client? And more often than not, it will. So, uh, and if you don't know about it, Ring someone, find something about. Yes, yeah, spot on. Look, um, I'm not going to go into too many additional parts to our presentation, but um, there's so many things that I've learned, and a lot of those aspects of what I've learned uh, is really from working with the BDMs on our panel. So this is just a small amount uh, on the, on the slide at the moment. It's quite amazing the aspects in in this area. Um, there's so many aspects to this that your BDMs make simple. You'd be so surprised. All of these little aspects, not only do they make things simple for us, but they'll actually walk you through and say, hey, this is what we need to do. This is, you know, the feedback that you get working with BDMs in this space, it amazes me that more, not more people do this. As I said, I, I was very new to this and if it wasn't for the people that are part of our panel today uh it certainly wouldn't be anything like the portion of our business that it is now so uh with that in mind if you like today's session please tell people please get on uh post on linkedin share um the whole purpose of broker illuminati was really a little bit of tongue-in-cheek illuminati refers to a secret society and it really shouldn't be a secret society for brokers to understand working capital and cash flow appropriately. And for those that those people that did attend, and for those people that catch the recording of this downstream, um, I'm very confident you've got a lot out of today, and that you will be better placed in terms of helping clients going forward. Thanks again to Amanda. Thanks to Patricia. Oh, sorry, Amanda and John. Patricia and Elise and Luke, thanks to Money Tech, Scott Pack, thanks to Cashflow Finance, thanks for everyone that has attended. I hope you got something out of it. If you had questions and, and didn't want to 
or haven't thought about them, please uh, let us know. And I think you'll find that our panel is more than happy to help. Um, I know they certainly have been with me. So thank you very much to all that attended. My, I may see you in our last session for today. Our last session today is a little bit of a, a weird and wacky one. For those people that are mortgage brokers and are looking at best interest duty, um, you might want to hear from a financial planner and understand how they have, have had to look at best interest duty. And I think there's a lot of key learnings for people in that space. Thanks again, everyone, for your time. Appreciate uh, your support.